Keep it coming. Keep it coming. Come on. <laughs> wow, what a great audience. No, uh, this is not a stand-up show, so uh, this is probably the, going to be the least technical one of this entire dev day. So I, it's going to be really interesting to see what kind of feedback I get after this, because it's a, a bit of a gambling, I don't know. Uh, well, we'll see in 45 minutes. So uh, my name is Petter Holmström with uh, two T's, so double T. And uh, I work as a Vardin architect, currently the only architect at Vardin. I've been doing that for about five years now. And in my opinion, that's actually a pretty short time. So um, I'm sure there are guys here who have been working as architects longer than that. Uh, but still, uh, during these uh, five years, I've picked up one or two things. I've experienced some things that I would like to share with you guys. So this is a kind of a personal presentation as well. It's uh, my point of view, my opinions about how I look at things about architecture. And uh, I hope it's at least thought provoking. And, uh, and uh, I look forward to actually discuss some of these matters with you in the uh, questions and answer sessions later today, especially if you do not agree with me. Because like I said, I'm the only architect, so I don't really have much peer support. I have to figure everything out myself, and I'd love to hear other opinions as well. So the uh, topic of, of this uh, speech is going to be picking the right architecture, sticking to it, and evolving it. And let's just get started. So this is uh, my first statement. So uh, even if we're doing agile development, like most probably do today, uh, the architecture is probably something you want to have uh, designed somewhat upfront. Now, I don't mean by that that you need to get everything right, but you need to know something. So you need to know where you're going. You need some kind of, of frame within you can move. Because if you don't know absolutely anything, you just start coding. It might turn out well, but it might also go straight to you know what. So you want to get it right from the be beginning. And uh, the most important things that you can do in the beginning of any project is do your homework. So project scope, this is probably the trickiest one, because it's, uh, it's uh, very dynamic for some reason. It's, uh, I don't think I've been in a single project where there weren't any scope changes. So uh, what is the customer actually expecting, and does the customer really know that? That's probably the first question. And unfortunately, I've noticed that the customer normally doesn't know what they want. They, they think they know, uh, but normally it doesn't. And uh, as I said, uh, as changing or especially a growing scope, that's a, a really com a common source for problems. They can be quite big. And especially a red flag is if they say that, oh, it's nothing so fancy, just a few screens, you know. We'll take a week or two and then it's done, right? So uh, if the customer says something like that, then you should be really scared. Because then they probably haven't thought it through. So then you will probably get this, oh, one more thing, oh, one more thing. And oh, by the way, oh, didn't I mention this? Oh, actually, we're going to need this. Oh, actually, uh, what I said last week was wrong. We actually need this, and so on. So uh, then you're up for uh, quite some, an interesting pro project, let's put it like that. So try to get the scope somewhat right, and at least try to get the customer to understand what the scope is and why it is important, and why they can't have everything now. All right, so next thing. These non-functional requirements, NFRs, how many of you know what non-functional requirements are? OK, so a few of you. All right, uh, uh, then I should probably start from the bottom. So examples of non-functional requirements, in English they are these ITs, so availability, performance, consistency, testability, security, safety, and so on. So availability would, for example, mean that uh, how available should your system be? Like uh, there are these five nines, which is 99.999% uh, uptime. 
uh, which is really, really easy for a customer to say, but uh, without really thinking about how it will affect the budget and the complexity of the software. And performance uh, has to do, for example, with response time. So how fast should the system be? I mean, a second a response time, that's really pretty slow for a UO. So you should probably strive for, I'd say, like 500 milliseconds average response time for my user action is probably like uh, the maximum before users are going to start to complain. So this is another requirement. Then consistency, for example, we have eventual consistency or this uh, serial or strong consistency. Uh, difference be being that uh, if you have a, a eventual consistency, when you turn enter some new piece of data into the system, uh, it might take a while before all your data sources are updated. So for example, if you have a clustered backend of databases, when you insert a new piece of data, it will take some time for the data to replicate. And during this time, the queries might return all the data. And in some cases, this is perfectly acceptable, in which case you're using eventual consistency. It's cheaper, it's less complex, it's easier to scale. But in some cases, it's absolutely vital that you always get the freshest data, then you need uh, strong consistency. Uh, it becomes more expensive, more complex. You need uh, different locking mechanisms. You need serial data access and so on. So these are these uh, types of things. Then we got testability. So how easy is it to test the system? Do you need to use automatic testing? Or do you're going to use some kind of end user testing, so on? Security, how do you prevent unauthorized access? How do you detect when somebody's doing something that they shouldn't? And so on. And then safety. By the way, do you know what's the difference between security and safety? No? All right, so safety is basically how do you prevent somebody from getting killed by your software? Uh, uh, probably not a problem in a business system, but let's say you're making a air control system, or a, a, a control system for an x-ray machine, or a control system for a, a, a railway crossing, then safety becomes a really big concern. Because if you accidentally do this little decimal error in the x-ray machine, and then you fry the patient, that's not good. Then we got legal requirements. Uh, Something that you very easily forget as a coder, but uh, can uh, cause you gray hair afterwards. For example, in Finland, there are different legislations uh, determining uh, or controlling what you can store, how long you can store it. For example, certain personal data you can only store for two years, after which it must be deleted. And uh, this is uh, things you should also try to discover, get right in the beginning, because if you're like the day before production, you realize that, oh, by the way, you will have to clean up half of your database uh, every second year, uh, you might be scratching your head a bit. So this is the non-functional requirements. And, and they are sort of uh, forming the boundaries for your architecture. This is uh, on, uh, on top of these NFRs, you will build your foundation for your application. That's why it's important to actually collect them up front and make sure that, uh, that the customer and you are on the same page. Because like I said, it's very easy to crank them up. Yeah, we're going to need 100% availability, and we need a 10 millisecond average response time, and so on. It's so easy to write. It's so easy to demand for a customer. But uh, you need really to know that, OK, if we have like 99.999% availability, what will it mean in terms of, of uh, budgets? Uh, how will the schedule of the project be affected? Is it actually a, a, a that big a requirement? I mean, wouldn't it be acceptable to have a restart of the system now one day? Do you really need session replication and failover? Or is it OK for the user to sometimes have to log in again and so on? Many cases, if you actually discuss this, you will find that, OK, these NFRs maybe aren't actually as strict as the customer initially thought, or it's not worth the extra cost. So this is a, a balance that you will need to do, and you have to make sure that the customer agrees with you. Uh, one more thing about NFRs. Uh, they should be measurable in some way. Because otherwise, you can't tell whether an NFR has been fulfilled or not. 
So uh, if you require 99.999% of availability, you need to agree with the customer, how are you going to measure this? How do you know that you actually have 99.999% availability? For example, availability is a bit tricky to measure. That's uh, probably one of the things that you can't try during the project, but you will need to implement some kind of, of monitoring so that you can actually track it in runtime in production if you have some kind of service level agreement and, and, and so on. Uh, performance, it's a lot easier, then you can just do uh, stress tests and measure the average response time, for example. All right, so uh, now you've had the discussions with the customer, you have some kind of idea of the scope. Uh, even if the customer is not sure about the scope, you probably know whether it's going to grow or not and how much it's going to grow in which direction it's going to grow. And you also know the non-functional requirements. So now you sort of have the specifications for your architecture. Now it's time to actually start designing it. Uh, this is a uh, first question. Should you play it safe or should you experience, say, experiment with something? Uh, it's always good to have more than one tool. It's this golden hammer phenomenon. If you have a golden hammer, every problem will look like a nail. And uh, in some cases, it's actually a nail, sometimes it's a screw, sometimes it's something completely different. And if you go banging it with a hammer, you will end up in serious trouble. So know your tools, make sure you have more than one that you can use. And it's a good idea to do some research. I mean, we have new, new technologies, new patterns, new frameworks are evolving all the time. And uh, so always a good idea to, in the beginning of a project, uh, See if there is something new and evolving, something that's sort of getting a lot of attention. Maybe this is something we could try out. Because there are actually customers who are pretty liberal about this, so they are open to experimentations. I've been in projects where we've got sort of free hands to do whatever we want. Uh, it's pretty rare, unfortunately, but it happens. But this is something worth checking out. Do you need to sort of play it safe? Go with the old and trust, uh, trusty Java EE architecture with the layers and JPA and also, or can you try something new like, let's say, a reactive ACA based architecture or something like that? So, check it out. Chances are you will find something that fits your project perfectly and that, what that might mean uh, the difference between success and failure. All right. Next question, to prototype or not to prototype? That's the question. Um, prototyping, uh, of course, it takes time, it takes money. So you need to decide whether it's worth the extra cost. Is it something the customer wants to pay for? Is it something the customer is gaining from? High risk features is a, a clear candidate for prototyping. So if you know this, uh, your system is going to have this one single feature, the make or break this feature, you're not really sure how you're gonna build it, then it's best to do some kind of a prototype from it so that you even have some kind of idea. Is it even possible or not? Non-trivial things, uh, that's another thing that you should probably prototype. So if you have a really, really complex stuff, it's probably a good idea to play around with it. You will. Uh, at least you will learn more about this stuff while you're prototyping it, and still you can throw it away afterwards. So you have a chance to do it right the second time. And then of course stuff you've never done before. So if you happen to be in a project where you can actually try out a new architectural pattern and the customer is willing to pay for this, you could probably do some kind of prototyping using this technology so that you know that is this something that we actually need or not. And finally, remember, a prototype is a prototype, so it's no more, no less, you throw it away afterwards. There are too many cases where a prototype is looking too good. It's, uh, I mean, uh, business people love good looking UI, so make sure your prototype is ugly. <laughs> yeah, because it's, if it isn't, they will think that, oh, the system is already finished, why can't we take this into production instead? I mean, it looks good and it does what we want, right? Why pay the extra money for, for something that's already done? That was fast. Then you will end up with a, a prototype in production, and then when the scope starts to grow and all the features requests are coming in, then you're crying and wishing you were working as a clerk in some kind of uh, grocery store.
This is the hard one. This is the one that I think is the most difficult one. Think about the future, but not too much. And uh, oh boy, if I had an answer to this question, I would be a millionaire. But uh, I don't, so you'll just have to make do with my opinions and thoughts on it instead. So uh, you don't want to over-design your architecture, right? You don't want to make it too complex. You don't want to spend time, spend money implementing stuff that end up going right down the trash because you don't need it. But you also don't want to underdesign and end up refactoring everything later. Uh, been there, done that. Has anybody else been in that situation, or am, am I the only one? I'm the only sorry bastard. Okay, there are a few hands. Thank you. And so it's a, a good idea to sort of try to get a, a, some kind of an idea. How are the scope and the NFR, NFRs, um, so non functional requirements, how are they going to change during the next? five years. I mean, is the system even going to be in production for five years? I mean, five years for a system, it's actually, well, it depends on what you, what you uh, compare it to. Five years could be a really long time for a system, but then again, we have these banking and insurance systems that are 40 years old and still running. So uh, what's the expect life expectancy of the system that you're building? Uh, is it uh, the user base expected to grow? I mean, is this something that now you have, let's say, in the beginning you have 100 users, and so within uh, two years you have 10,000 users, and then within five years you have 100,000 users? Is that something that the customer is expecting? Uh, then you're definitely going to need to take that into account, because otherwise it will not happen. Because if you design a system for 100 users, it most, well, it won't work for 100,000 users, let's put it like that. And then, of course, are there any long, long, low-hanging fruits? So are there any sort of uh, features that you could build into your architecture very easily that you don't necessarily need, but they are easy to add? You might need them in the future. They don't cost much. Then you might as well throw them in. <laughs> and also, are there any high-risk features that you don't really know whether you're going to need, but if you end up needing them, it's a make or break. Thing. So, uh, uh, chances are the customer is not aware of this until afterwards. Uh, but at least ask the question. So, if there are, are there anything that that sort of uh, really, really crucial to the system, but you're still not sure whether you're going to need it or not, then it might be a good idea to plan for it anyway. Hey, what could go wrong? What if you? Why should you actually worry too much about getting the architecture right? And most of these things are, are, are stuff that I've experienced myself in real projects. You know, that feeling when you get that cold, chilling sensation down your spine. Realize, oh. So, uh, first one is probably the most common one. So, a system becomes too slow the number of features and users increases. So while you're running it locally on your machine with a single user and some hello world data, everything's fine. You get really good performance uh, results. It's uh, good response times. And then you start to add a couple of users, and then you have like 10 or 20 users and some real world data, and then it becomes really slow. And then your uh, release date is approaching really quickly, and you don't really know what to do. I hate it. Another thing, uh, especially if the scope grows a lot more than you expected, so your system becomes harder to maintain and extend. So that's uh, it's not the customer that's complaining; it's the developers. They are swearing, cursing at you. Uh, it's making your architecture is making their lives miserable. They want to change jobs. Well, now I'm exaggerating, but you know. So uh, then you got in something wrong, right? Or then you have uh, very, very complex, nicely designed multi-threading features and synchronous stuff that looks really fancy and enterprisey and architecture-y. And, and, and then when you actually start to use them, well, it works fine with a few users. And then when the load goes out, you start getting these really strange multi-threaded problems. You will end up getting a bug tickets that you can't reproduce, because the only way to reproduce them is under heavy load. So you'd actually have to plug into the production or testing servers with some kind of profiler, and you don't have permission to do that, because the system administrators doesn't trust you, and so on. 
Uh, then we have, uh, this is something, and uh, your system or database does not scale up well enough or doesn't scale at all. So uh, maybe you're sort of, uh, all databases are fast when we're just talking about a few hello world records. But when you start to add like hundreds of thousands of records or millions of records, uh, things like indexes start to pay very, make very much sense. And if you're lucky, that's all that's missing. And you can just add a few indexes to your database and then problem over. And if you're not lucky, then you might have to even change the database. Another thing I run into, uh, you have existing systems. Very rarely you actually build a standalone system. There are always existing systems that you need to integrate with. And uh, normally when you start a new project, that's sort of the easy part, okay? We're gonna worry about the integration later, okay? We're just gonna add a REST, uh, REST uh, interface there, and then we add some middleware there, and then we add some buses there, and okay, let's do that uh, later. We are not worry about that. Let's focus on this fancy UI. And uh, then it turns out that, oh, okay, so this is a REST interface, but it needs to do a Kerberos authentication. And uh, if anybody here has done Kerberos authentication in Java, it's possible, but yeah, <laughs> I got this sign. Uh, it is possible, but it's really, really hard. Uh, so uh, one of those things that should probably have checked out in the beginning and tried it out as a prototype. Or then you start to experience data integrity problems as your data model becomes more complex. Uh, this is something that, uh, uh, especially if you're using, uh, say, uh, using Hibernate or Eclipse Link, you have a very, very large uh, domain model, entity model. You're using uh, lazy loading. You don't really keep track of your transactions and you don't really have any discipline in what entity can reference which entity. So you're basically re if referencing, you're cascading a little bit here, and then you might cascade there, and then you cascade there, and then you have a reference going that way, and then two references going that way. And then you mix this up, and you will get a, a nice uh, plate of spaghetti entity data integrity problems where some entities end up being saved three times in the database, some entities aren't saved at all. You get optimistic locking errors every now and then, your cache is out, uh, is out of sync and so on. Uh, I've been in a project like this. Uh, mind you, I didn't cause that mess. More things that can go wrong. Um, Problems in other systems cascade to your system or vice versa. I mean, especially if you're building distributed systems. Uh, this is something uh, that you should probably think about more earlier than later. Because uh, um, there are, to be able to protect against cascading errors, there are certain things, patterns, stuff you need to build into your system. You can't just sort of rely on, on the platform doing it for you. There are things you might need to do, you might need to be aware of. So, uh, of course, if you have only two systems and one goes down, then the other one is unusable as well. But let's say you have 10 systems, and if one of them goes down, you still want to be able to use the other nine. And this is something you need to take into account in the beginning. Or then uh, you have a monolithic system, so everything is compiled into a single jar, everything is running in the same VM, and then it starts to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and grow because of scope creep again. Customer didn't know what they wanted. And then it, uh, you realize that, okay, now I have to do this and turn this into a distributed system. And, uh, well, if you have the system modular enough with clear sort of boundaries between the modulars, this can be pretty easy. But let's say, what if your entity model relies on lazy loading, and you need to turn the system into a distributed one. And then you probably need to redesign your entire data model, because you can't no longer have uh, uh, lazy loading, because the entity manager that produced the entity might be running on another server. Uh, then we have this one, have to replace the entire data storage system. Uh, I once uh, had to join a project that had been designed around a uh, graph database. And then about halfway down the project, they decided that, okay, for some reason, we have to change this to a SQL database. 
And if you know uh, about graph databases, you know that they are very different from SQL databases. So it took, uh, I think it took a month actually to perform this, this transformation. So uh, we did it and it worked, but it took uh, one month extra time away from the project. So that's something that can happen. And then we have authentication or authorization systems. You might have to change that. Uh, this can be either good or bad. You might have to start up with some really, really tricky, complex company enterprise single sign-on only to get permission to move down to a simpler one, in which case it's really good. Or you might have to go the other way around, in which case uh, you may grow early gray hairs. Or then you might have to replace the remoting protocol. Let's say that you start up with an environment where you have control of all of all your, your servers. Let's say you have a Spring-based system, so you can use Spring HTTP invokers. They are, it's a Spring-specific uh, protocol for doing remoting. And then all of a sudden you have a .NET client that wants to join, and then you have to change the protocol to, for example, REST or SOAP or something. Uh, might not be that big a deal, but still something that can happen. So always remember Murphy's Law. If something can go wrong, it will. And if it can't go wrong, it will anyway. And even if you know about Murphy's Law and do everything you can to circumvent it, it will still go wrong. So, my opinion, better to over-design a little and end up with stuff that you don't need, than to under-design and end up refactoring everything later. So, in my opinion, it's better to do a little bit more than you might actually need. And uh, this doesn't mean you actually have to implement everything. You don't have to write all the code for all the features, but it's a good idea to keep in mind that, for example, okay, this is a remoting interface to another system. We might be needing a circuit breaker here to prevent errors from cascading. But we're not sure we're going to need it right now because it might be uh, not such a, an important system. It, let's say we only have, this is the only integration, so if this goes down, this one is unusable, and if this goes down, it doesn't affect this system. So it's not a critical link, but if the systems will start to multiply, we will get more, then it will be increasingly more important to protect against cascading errors. So we're going to design the system in such a way that over here I can add a circuit breaker, here I can add some logging, here I can add some extra security stuff, whatever. Uh, this system can be taken out and moved to another server, so you have these things in mind, you don't implement it like that, but you sort of make preparations for it. So that if the day comes, you can pretty easily add the circuit breaker, plug it in, or take your subsystem, move it to another server, fire it up with some remoting protocol. So uh, that can make your life a lot easier, if, especially if the scope is, is not clear. Still, try to kiss as much as you can. Everybody likes kissing. And that, of course, stands for keep it simple, stupid. I don't know what you were thinking about. All right. And anyway, good, good rule of thumb. Uh, low coupling, high cohesion, that will take you far. This looks, sounds like something that you read from entry-level programming developer's patterns book, but it's, it's actually true. So try to keep your components small and cohesive enough and have low coupling between them, then it's a lot easier to break them out, move them to other stuff, other systems, refactor them, and so on. All right, so and when you're designing your architecture, you also need to document it. And uh, I know that there are a lot of architecture documentation standards out there, especially big banks and customers probably like to use them. I have to confess, I don't know a single one of them. Uh, because, uh, in my opinion, uh, I really hate to write documentation just for the sake of writing documentation. I mean, you really, you really need to think who you're writing for. And in my opinion, you're writing for yourself, you're writing for your team, you might be writing for the customer representative, and no one else. Except, of course, if there is some company standard that you have to fill in, like 
plots and lots of forms and standards and have everything there. So my actually my, my preference when documenting architecture is to use a wiki, bullet points and diagrams. So I like a wiki because you can really easily structure it up into pages, sub pages. You can easily link from one page to another so you don't need to repeat yourself. I also like diagrams because hey you know they say a picture says more than a thousand words. So I like to draw diagrams. I normally use UML um, ish, so not necessarily pure UML, uh, but I like to draw boxes and arrows between them and, and use nice icons and colors and stuff like that. So I try to draw up so that I understand it and hopefully my colleagues will as well. And then some bullet points below that explains the sort of essential parts. And so far this has been uh, quite enough. It's uh, small enough so that the developers will actually read it and also small enough so that it will stay more or less up to date. It will always get outdated. Basically, as soon as you start writing code, your documentation is outdated. But at least it might be useful in some way. And, uh, well, keep it short and to the point. And this is something, it's an iterative process. So uh, you don't need to get it right from the beginning. You can't get it right from the beginning. This is something that evolves probably throughout the project. What are you going to include in this documentation? Now you have your, your wiki set up. Now you're going to start write stuff. This is, uh, this is how I do it. So uh, design decisions. This is quite important part. So every time you have more than one option, you need to pick one. So write down the other options as well and why you ended up selecting this one. Because uh, if you're like me, I have a really short memory. And then like six months down the road, I might read my own code and figure, what the f was I thinking? I mean, why did I do it like this? Then I can go down to design decisions. Oh, right. There was a good uh, reason behind it, because uh, there was this other problem that I had already forgotten about that still exists. Or then you have developers coming to you and asking, that, what the is this? What are you, why are we doing it like that? And then you can sort of go back to design decision and say that, oh, I or we decided to go this road because blah, 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 blah. All right, next one, non-functional requirements. If you have a formal non-functional requirement, you should write it down and also explain what you mean by it. Because uh, let's take availability. So what does it mean that the system is available? The customer might have a very different opinion about it than you. So try to write it down so that you know that you're talking about the same thing. Also, metrics, how to measure them. Like I said in the beginning, there's absolutely no point in having a requirement and you don't know how to tell for sure that you're actually meeting it. So how are you going to measure this requirement and what, is the, what are the thresholds? Then we have these uh, tactics. So a uh, few lines, how are you going to design your system so that you can achieve this goal? For example, if you have a, a high availability requirements, uh, typical tactics is, of course, replication. So you make sure that there are at least two items of every component and that there's automatic failover. So if one item goes down, the other one will take over. That is a way of getting high availability. Uh, priority. So how important is this uh, NFR? Because not all NFRs are equal, and if you're, you might end up in a situation where you don't have budget or your schedule doesn't allow you to implement them all. So which one is, is more important? Which one should you take first? Which one can you leave out? And finally, the risk. So if you don't get this NFR right, will it risk the existence of the project? So uh, obviously, high-risk NFRs, deal breakers, you should address them first, whereas low risk NFRs, you can address them later. So these are the things that you should list for, for the NFRs. And make sure the customer agrees with you on this. You don't want to end up in a situation when the project ends and you start to fight about an NFR, whether it's uh, being fulfilled or not. All right, then we're going to start designing the system. Uh, and I like to start with something that I call a conceptual design, which is basically a helicopter view. So you take a, a lot of steps back, or you jump really high and try to imagine that you're looking at the system from, from a high altitude. 
So you want to see the system boundaries. So uh, where does your system start and where does it end? Where are your responsibilities? Especially if you're plugging this in into an existing infrastructure, an existing environment, you want to know which parts can you control, which parts are out of your control. You also want to know the external systems. So which systems do you actually need to integrate with and which ones can you just forget about? And it's also a good idea to sort of think about some kind of initial split up into subsystems. So uh, unless it's a really, really simple system, you can probably split it up into different clearly defined responsibilities. So this part of system is going to do that, then we can turn that into a subsystem, and this part is going to do that. And this system here is going to rely on that system there, but this system here can be completely independent, whereas that system over there will need both of them and so on. So very sort of high level splitting up helps you to, uh, it will help you later on if you have some kind of idea what, what you're doing. And here's also a good idea to think about architectural styles. So uh, will you be doing some kind of uh, a typical service-based architecture, for example? Are you going to do pipes and filters somewhere? Are you going to do, uh, use an event bus or a service bus that all your systems uh, subscribe to and publish events to? These kinds of things. Integration design. So if you don't have any external systems, then this is the easy part. You can just leave it out. But in most cases, there are more than one external system you need to integrate with, and then it's a good idea to plan them now. So how are you going to integrate it? Can you use some kind of, is there some kind of proprietary protocol that you might need to implement yourself? Is it available for Java? Do you have a Java client? Are you going to use SOAP? Which version? Are you going to use REST? Are you going to use REST over HTTP or REST over JMS? Or are you going to use some kind of AMQP or some other protocol? How important is this integration? What's the risk? If I don't get this working properly, will it fail the project? And also, do you need to write a proof of concept to make sure that this is actually something you can do? This might also be a good idea because the proof of concept is, uh, is something that uh, you, can, uh, you can use as a test throughout your project to make sure that the other end is still functioning. Then we have technology stack. So uh, which application server are you going to choose? Which database server are you going to choose? Are you going to use some kind of middleware? Which frameworks, Vardin of course? Uh, which library are you going to use? Uh, what are the licenses? What are the versions? And then you probably need to get the customer to approve of them as well. Then you do the technical design. So now you actually have to turn your conceptual design into a, a technical design using your technology stack. So let's say you're using EGBs and Vardin. How exactly are you going to implement your system using EGBs and Vardin? Uh, deployment design. How are you actually going to deploy this system? So network, how are you going to, do you need firewalls here, and then we need a load balancer there, and then we have these and these servers, are we going to deploy it to cloud service, or are we going to deploy it in a machine room, and so on. Concurrency design, do you have threads, parallel operations, how are you going to synchronize them, are they going to communicate with each other, and so on. Data design, will you be using SQL, no SQL, will you be using uh, JPA, something else, JOOQ, Security, of course, how are you going to do authentication, authorization, auditing, encryption. And then also, for each NFR, how is your technical design uh, fulfilling your NFR? So then if the customer has any questions, then you can show that, yes, we have addressed this NFR by doing this and this and this. All right, implementation time. Uh, so uh, according to my watch, I should have five minutes left, but I, yeah. So uh, this is, uh, I probably have to, to do this a little bit faster. And uh, by mind of you, I already cut 20 minutes from this presentation. Um, all right, so uh, this is a really important thing uh, that uh, many projects get wrong. And that is to set up a proper testing environment in the beginning. And uh, remember, in a computer system, you have either none, one, or a lot of stuff. So uh, if you're expecting to have like uh, 
some, some component to be replicated, make sure you have at least two of them in the testing environment. So, and uh, because, uh, well, let's just take an example caching. I mean, if you have a, let's say you use Hibernate with a, a level two cache enabled, then it will work fine until you actually fire up another application server instance, which has its other cache. You forget that these caches need to be synchronized with each other, then you will be in trouble. So always make sure that if you're going to replicate something, make sure you have it in your testing environment up front from day one. And you can use old hardware lying around in the, in, in the office. You can use Raspberry Pis. You can set up a cloud. Uh, I have a virtual box uh, cluster on my laptop that I can use to, to run tests. Uh, it depends on, on your needs, but make sure you have a testing environment that resembles the production environment so that you can actually try it out from day one. Encryption is also one of those things that you add later when needed, and then it turns out that, no, it's not actually that easy. Especially, how are you going to generate... Uh, well, generating certificates, that's easy, but how are you going to distribute them? How are you going to keep them up to date? How are you going to make sure that if you need end-to-end -end encryption, how do you make sure that the data is encrypted through all the point ju jumps in, in the network? Uh, try it out from the beginning, and yes, you can still change it later. Then you create a skeleton application. So it's a, a system that just hums for itself, some nice tune. And uh, most critical components and interfaces, they should all be present. And it should be able to, you should be able to deploy this in your testing environment. But you don't really need to do anything yet. But the, this is sort of the skeleton on which you're going to start to build features. Think about the developers. Try to make it as easy as possible to set up this, uh, this environment. Uh, I try to make my projects in such a way that you can just clone it. Then you do uh, the priming build in Maven, and then there's some Maven project that will run it and will fire up all the components and in-memory databases and so on, so that you can get started immediately. That's a, a good starting point. Testing. What are you going to test? You probably don't have the resources or, or budget to test everything, so you should make sure that the tests you write are bring the most value. So are you going to do automatic unit tests, integration tests, acceptance tests, performance tests? What are you going to test? Why are you testing? There's no point in testing just to get a high test coverage percentage. The test that you write should help you to improve the quality of the software. There's no point in writing a test that just goes through every line in the code, and then you write a test for that line, and then you do another line, and then you write another test, and you end up like hundreds of test methods for a class with 10 methods. All right, then we have the tricky part again, convince the rest of the team. So I have two minutes left according to this. So teach and explain. Make sure that your team understands and accepts your architecture. So why have you decide, uh, decide, designed it in this way? Encourage people to challenge your designs, because you might have missed something. So uh, Also, it's a good idea, because then you actually have to sort of form valid arguments for all your design decisions. If you have somebody challenging you, then why are you doing this instead of that? Then you need to be able to get a valid answer. Otherwise, you probably don't know what you're doing. And if it's an experienced team, there are knowledge there that you really want to use, because it could make or break your project. This is, a, in my opinion, a, a really hard question. So how, hard, how strictly are you going to enforce your architecture? So are you going to sort of be really strict and force all the features to be implemented in the same way? Or are you going to allow for some kind of, of flexibility? I mean, if you have a strict architecture, then it's easy for junior developers, it's easy for maintenance developers, because everything is implemented in the same way. But if you do it loosely, then uh, developer productivity might get a little bit higher, because you can bypass some stuff. But then again, here are some examples. Then again, uh, it's uh, a lot more difficult for somebody who doesn't know the system to, to learn it. So for example, uh, is it OK? to contact your persistence layer directly from the UI if you're making an administration screen that just adds and removes master data? Is it OK to just uh, access the entity manager directly, or do you need to add a service with get, save, delete in between? Or 
do you have to use DTOs in your UI or is it uh, okay to return entities? Sometimes it's perfectly okay, sometimes it might not, and so on. So these are the types of questions that your developers are most likely going to ask you. And uh, I think it's, uh, this is one of the more difficult questions to answer because uh, it's not black and white. All right, stick to your architecture, the final part. See, yeah, I'm gonna keep this really short. So uh, probably uh, you need to, uh, the most important things on these slides are probably this, avoid a my way or the highway or whatever I don't care attitude. So uh, talk to your colleagues. Make sure that, that, that you know what they think about the architecture. Is it working in practice? Because you probably had an idea when you wrote it, but you have no idea whether it works in practice. Is it making the lives of the developers easier? Are they happy with it? Or are they, uh, is it making their lives miserable? Is there something fundamentally wrong with it? Listen to what they have to say, and remember that the architecture is not your baby, even though you have designed it and you're sort of all the fancy stuff and every clever thing that you put into it, it's still not yours. It's the team's architecture. It's the, the outcome of the project, the, the performance of the team is that matters. If you screwed up in the architecture and somebody comes, uh, a team member has a, a solution for you, then you should accept that solution, even though it's, uh, it's your mistake, so to speak. So the success of the project and the team, that's all that matters. And uh, I think uh, I have a couple of more slides actually, but we're, we're running behind schedule. So I think uh, we're going to have to stop here. And again, write down your questions and comments because this is a, a subject that I'm really interested in. And I love to discuss, uh, especially if you have other ideas. I also, of course, want to hear if you agree with me, but uh, if you don't agree with me, I want to hear about that as well. So uh, yeah. That's all for this time, and uh, I hope to have very nice discussions about this uh, later today. Thank you.